Hey, it's Mike here, and today, an environmental impact diet showdown in the form of a very recent Oxford study. You thought by showdown, I meant some type of cage fight or brawl? No, just a bunch of scientists crunching numbers, sorry. This came out just a few days ago, and I'm impressed with it because it didn't just look at various types of emissions, but it also looked at other impacts like land and water and the impacts on wildlife. The results are dramatic, and just for fun, I'm also going to throw in a little carnivore diet column here and there, so we can really emphasize the impact of that. But really quickly, I want to announce my fully vegan trip to Costa Rica that is coming up fast, September 24th to 30th. And I've officially started a vegan travel company called Vigo Travel. I'll talk more about that in a second, but let's just go to the study. Here it is in the journal Nature, and it used Epic Oxford dietary data on 55,000 individuals, and it split them into six groups. We got your vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, and then three levels of meat consumption. And we always have to look right to the conflicts of interest. And in this case, no conflicts of interest. No, this wasn't funded by vegans making meat eaters look bad, Incorporated, which is a company that I should probably start. Why not start another one? And so how did they actually estimate the impacts of foods? That's where this one's a bit more advanced. They say, quote, they used a review of 570 life cycle assessments covering more than 38,000 farms in 190. 19 countries, no biggie. So compared to other estimates out there and even other studies, this one goes a bit further, a little bit higher quality here. We're not just talking about some napkin level calculations, which I will do later for the carnivore diet. <laughs> To emphasize that, we can go to this quote in The Guardian, quote, Professor Richard Tiffin at the University of Reading said, quote, this study represents the most comprehensive attempt to link food consumption data to the data on the environmental impacts of food production. And among the authors there, you have Scarborough, who may seem familiar because they also did a 2014 study looking at a lot of this same stuff. They used the same Epic Oxford database on terms of what people eat, but it just didn't go that deeply as much into the environmental impacts of different types and with as much data. So they needed to do another one that was a bit more in depth. And the results of that 2023 study, that's a bit more in depth from a few days ago. It said that the dietary impacts of vegans were 75% lower than the high meat eaters for greenhouse gas emissions. And fun fact, as this paper mentions, that high meat category is over 100 grams, really just the average American who eats between 100 and 150 grams of meat per day. This is important because a lot of people in the US would probably think that they would qualify as medium meat eaters because they just kind of eat what seems like an average amount of meat. Well, no, that is high. And people just like to look at themselves in the best light. We all do it. And they broke emissions down further in table two, which shows a comparison of all groups for emissions in terms of CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide. Now look at that middle column for methane. Vegans are about 15 times lower than high meat eaters. And this is where we can really start to see a breakaway between vegans and the rest of the pack, even including vegetarians. You can see a pretty big gap between the vegans and the vegetarians even. And that really is a theme of the study that there are many pretty big benefits that you get from making that jump from vegetarian to vegan. For nitrous oxide, vegans were also three and a half times lower than your high meat eaters. Let's just call them average Americans. <laughs> and for those that don't know, NO2, nitrous oxide, is a pretty powerful greenhouse gas that comes mainly from agriculture and of that pie, we're talking about mainly fertilizer and animal manure. And yeah, fertilizer is used for a lot of different plants, but a ton of that fertilizer is used to grow feed for animals. Now, continuing on with land and water, 25% lower land use for the vegans and 55% lower water use. That much less land is huge. It's not quite as much as one eighth that we've seen in another study, the carrying capacity study in Elementa. But when you consider that 50% of the habitable land on planet Earth is used for agriculture. Uh, yeah, if we can knock 75% off of that, the possibilities are endless. That's actually my main motivation to be vegan is to get so much land clear that someone gives me my own plot of land that I can then turn into a bunch of suspended trampolines you can jump from with like little waterfalls and hot tubs. And this is really where the one-two punch of emissions comes in of not just saving, reducing emissions with the vegan diet, but freeing up land that can do so. 75% less, you can then do things like plant trees or whatever plant is most appropriate to the biome so that you can sequester a ton of carbon. 
I did a quick calculation a while back that if the US did that and planted as many trees as possible, that could maybe offset about 80% of emissions, which would be pretty amazing but it would take a while to get there. 55% less water use, that is quite a big deal, but then I can't help but think of all the water use analyses I've done in previous videos, especially in areas where water really does matter, where there is water scarcity, like in the American West, my video on the Great Salt Lake and my video on the Colorado River, where you know we're talking at least 70% of that water, oftentimes virtually all of the water in those areas, depending on where you're looking, which state is used for animal agriculture. Agriculture. So for whatever reason, in these water scarce areas, we love to just dump water into animal agriculture. And so I think a vegan diet would actually make a bigger difference here than that 55% figure it leads on. Continues with a vegan diet having about 75% less eutrophication, which we'll elaborate on, and about 65% less damage to biodiversity or species extinction. Eutrophication is a topic that seemed to be missing in a few of the articles I read. We are talking about nutrients from agriculture, making it into waterways and causing algae blooms, which then suck up all the oxygen, creating dead zones that kill off all the fish and other wildlife. So this is another way of saying that a vegan diet has a 75% reduction in dead zone creation. But then also if you're looking, you know, in different states, Inland, we can see a lot of impaired waterways, and those are also created by eutrophication. You know, even just the local ponds here in Iowa, because of agricultural runoff, are often just these nasty, sort of toxic algae blooms that you don't want to go in. I wish I could, but dead zones are also key. I mean, we have about 400 of them on planet Earth, depending on the time of year. And this really does track with previous reports like this one, which claims that Tyson, the chicken manufacturer, chicken grower and slaughterer, is the main single contributor to the Gulf of Mexico dead zone. E. Tyson of a... Now to biodiversity, which a vegan diet really breaks away from the pack in. You can just see we have a cluster of all those other diets, like a vegetarian diet, and then boom, a vegan diet sitting there at about two thirds less of an impact, less of a species extinction driving force. A lot of people would think that a vegetarian diet pretty much gets you where a vegan diet does, but in this case, it especially does not. So that's you know, a pretty good motivator if you care about animals and are a vegetarian. And this also tracks quite well with another previous a study, this one, which claims that species extinction is mainly driven by the consumption of meat. However, I should mention that this biodiversity impact score actually does not include marine animals, as the study says is a limitation. And that's why eutrophication here is important as well. But the reality is the biodiversity impact would probably be even lower if it did include all those little swimmy fishy guys. And I think the term dead zone explains why. Anyway, moving on to time scale here, which is often ignored by studies. We're generally looking at a 100 year time scale and how much greenhouse gases affect planet Earth over 100 years. However, we kind of care about stopping climate change as soon as possible, so they at least included a 20-year global warming potential here, and a vegan diet does even better. It breaks an 80% reduction. This difference is likely due to how methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas, especially in the short term. However, like I mentioned in the past, none of these studies ever include the airborne fraction, which is where you know, virtually all methane is making it up into the atmosphere, but less than half of CO2 does just based off it getting sucked up by trees and the ocean and things like that. So you basically need to double the methane impact there, but let's just move right along to carnivore diets. I like throwing in carnivore diets here because there's virtually no studies on carnivore diets and people like to just completely ignore the environmental impact of that or totally just delude themselves with some green washed regenerative agriculture. I have a whole video on that. I'll try to throw down below. But that high meat eater in this Oxford study came in at 140 grams on average. Well, with two pounds of steak eaten per day, often by carnivore dieters, we're talking about 900 grams, so over six times the amount of meat. Sadly, they didn't break down in this 2023 study the exact amount of meat that was poultry and beef, etc. So we'll do a rough estimate here. And actually, because beef has such a higher impact, is the highest impact besides lamb, well, <laughs> it's probably going to be underestimated, but we can see, you know, right off the bat, probably around 24 times 
the emissions of a vegan diet for a carnivore diet, looking to biodiversity that also lands in at around 24 times the species extinction on a carnivore diet, which if you're on that diet, you probably don't care about animals, but you know, maybe you care about the planet a little bit. So I don't know. <laughs> Meat eating alpha males don't need a planet to live on. <laughs> We can just live on our own insecurities. All right, now I do wanna take a second to share the details of this Costa Rica trip, which is you know officially going live today. We're doing seven days and six nights in conjunction with a fully vegan hotel. So it's gonna have all of this vegan food and it's connected to an animal sanctuary. And of course, Costa Rica is gonna be amazing to all this adventure stuff like snorkeling and zip lining and canyoning and rafting and doing nature hikes and tours like one to a volcano. We're gonna see a big lake and go on a boat. And yes, I did start my own travel company here just because the pre-made trips in the past haven't been vegan from the ground up, but this one will be. And and also this way I can save some money. So this is definitely a cheaper trip than it otherwise would have been. I also heard feedback from travelers and added a bunch of details say, to the itinerary, made a downloadable itinerary, etc. So you just go to the website, see if you wanna come. And if you do, there's a ton of different ways to pay. And I even added a firm in case people wanna pay in different installments to make it more affordable. And it does start on September 24th, which I know is coming up. It's like two months away, but we gotta fight that wet season. And I only heard about this place pretty recently. So let's make it happen, link below. But going back to the study in the end, yeah, looking at what is probably the highest quality study on this topic, we see an even more emphasized benefit for people going on a vegan diet, 75% lower emissions, 80 plus percent lower emissions if you're talking about a 20 year time frame, and just so many environmental benefits. I'm so happy they looked at biodiversity and sort of dead zone creation power. Now, until now, we haven't actually had a study saying a vegan diet reduces those by this much, and now we do, which is awesome, and it's gonna be a lot easier to just talk about these subjects. And finally, we of course see that stepwise decrease from high meat, less meat, less meat, pescatarian, just vegetarian, and then even that breakaway with the vegan group there on several metrics being like, hey, you know, a vegetarian diet helps, but oftentimes you're cutting it down again by like 50% by going vegan, which is incredible to see. All right, let me know down below what you thought about this study, if there's anything I missed in there, and of course, feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.